Good morning, North Point City Church, and uh, everyone else joining us from wherever you may be watching. We really want to thank you for uh, joining in with us this morning as we gather together to lift up the name of Jesus, to open up the Bible, and to hear what the Lord is having to say to us today. But just before we get into that, uh, just a couple of quick announcements uh, to make us aware of as we head into this next week. Uh, for those of you uh, who are not aware, is we are continuing our prayer meetings on a Wednesday night from half past six to half past seven as a church together. We corporately pray on Zoom, and it's open for everybody to join us. These times have been of great encouragement to us as we've gathered on Zoom to pray for one another, pray for our country, pray for what's happening in the world. And so I really want to take this time to encourage you from half past six to half past seven, every Wednesday night, we gather together on Zoom. You can go to our website, which I'll tell you later on, to find how to get involved and to join us for that as well. We also have a men's prayer meeting every Friday morning, which starts at 5.30, half past five. I know that's early in winter especially, uh, but uh, for those early birds who want to join uh, the men's prayer meeting on a Friday morning, you are most welcome to join us during that time. Then also something we're very excited about at the moment is we are having our first Zoom online men's meeting at North Point City Church. And so I want to call all the men uh, and all the men who has friends to let your friends know that on the 19th of June at half past six, we're going to be getting together for our first online men's meeting uh, on Zoom. So please join us. Uh, we're going to look at a great topic uh, from a great portion of Scripture in Hebrews uh, that speaks about that even in the stormy world, we have an anchor for our soul uh, that goes behind the veil. We're also going to hear from some men at North Point, uh, some incredible testimonies of how God has protected them and led them. And so I really want to encourage you, don't miss out. It's going to be a wonderful time. Uh, we will send out the details exactly how you can log in to Zoom to join us for that men's, pre -me uh, men's meeting as well uh, on the 19th of June at half past six. And then also lastly, I want to just take a time uh, this morning to thank you again. Thank you, North Point, for your incredible generosity over this time. You know, we have been able to feed hundreds, uh, actually thousands of families during the lockdown time. As you would know, uh, things are very desperate. It's getting more and more difficult. But your generosity has enabled us to get food to many, many families. And we really want to take a time to just thank you. Also, thank you to each and every volunteer who's given your time to come to the building, to help pack food packs, to get into the communities, to go and share the love of God. Wherever this food has gone, the message of the gospel has also rung out. So I really want to take time from us as an eldership team to thank you, each and every one of you, for your incredible service during this time. It really has changed many, many lives. And so I would like to pray for us. Uh, but just before I do that, you can find all these details on www.npcc.org. Za, and how to join us for our prayer meetings, for our men's meetings, and whatever else, uh, any other details you might want to know. All our banking details are on there, and we want to continue to feed many families, and we can only do that as you continue to be generous. So I want to encourage you to continue to give uh, so that we can, as a church, continue to feed the poor and look after those who are most desperate during this time. Would you pray with me now as we commit this morning's meeting to the Lord together? Father, we thank you that we can gather this morning. We might be separated in different homes, in our lounges, in different areas. I know there are even people uh, dialing in from across the world this morning, Lord. And I pray this morning that we would be reminded again, Jesus, that although we separated from one another this morning, we have this incredible promise that you yourself gave us, Jesus. We're reminded in Matthew 28, it says, I will be with you to the end of the age. And we thank you, Lord, that we are reminded this morning that yet we might be separated, but none of us are alone because we have you with us. And so this morning, Lord God, may you be exalted in our time of praise and worship together. We think this morning as we open up the word, as we continue in this incredible gospel of Mark, may our hearts be mightily encouraged. May we encounter you this morning, Christ, and may our lives never be the same because of your word and the work of your spirit in and through our lives. We commit this time to you now. We say, fill us with your spirit and lead us as we submit to you this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. I once had a heart that was dead in the grave, bound in the darkness, a powerless slave. Then heaven reached down from the cross to my soul.
world started to shake and it had to let go I'll never get over it I'll never get over it I was dead in my sin but your love wouldn't quit and I'll never get over it those chains and he said me
God's love for us How vast beyond all measure That He would give His only Son To make a wretch His treasure How great the pain of searing loss The Father turns His face away Wounds which mother chosen one bring many sons to glory. Behold the man upon the cross, my guilt upon his shoulder. Ashamed I hear my mocking voice Call out among the scoffers It was my sin that held him there Until it was accomplished His dying breath has brought me life I know that it is fair
family and uh, everyone tuning in. My name is Sean and it's a great uh, privilege to be able to preach God's word to you this morning. So let's bow our heads in a word of prayer as we get into God's word. Father, we want to thank you for your word, which is perfect, which is full of your authority, Lord, which is enough for us, which is able to bring life by the power of the Spirit into our hearts and into our minds. We pray now, Lord, that you would open up our hearts and our minds to hear what the Spirit is saying through the word of God this morning. And may our hearts and minds be transformed. May we see Jesus more clearly. May we walk more faithfully and obediently to him. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So what a great journey it has been going through the Gospel of Mark. It's such an exhilarating, action-packed account of who Jesus is and what he came to do. And we're now in chapter 10. And the picture of Jesus and his work here on earth is becoming so much more clearer. With today's account, we are reaching another significant point in the book where Jesus' focus is revealed, while at the same time, his disciples' hearts and motives are being exposed as he is preparing them. It's a time where Jesus' popularity is declining and where his teaching is no longer for the big crowds, but more focused on his disciples as he is preparing them. Today is about focus and correct understanding. And I don't know about you, but in my life, I've had people by God's grace that have helped me to stay focused and helped me with not having a misunderstanding of the major things in life. In other words, people that helped me to stay focused on the main thing and not on the periphery things. To see what is the main thing and what is the consequences of that main thing. To focus on the root cause and not on symptoms. One of them in my life was a science teacher at high school that I can remember who used to say these two things, which I'll remember for a very long time. The first thing he used to say was, you need to remember your pillars on which you can hang things. In other words, uh, in the realm of science, you need to understand what are the foundational and the main things so that you could hang other things on. So you need to know what the main principles are, which you can apply to many things in life. It's no use just memorizing things, but understand the main things, and then you can have application of many other things. He would uh, go to the extent of asking us to to divide our books into two-thirds and one-third. And in the one-third column, you needed to write all of these main principles, these main pillars on which everything else would hang. And that was something that helped me to focus on the main things. The second thing he used to say is when we were um, doing some discourse around science and that sort of stuff, and when we'd give an answer and it would be totally wrong or a misunderstanding, he would say, No, my friend, you've got the wrong end of the stick. In other words, you've reversed things around. You've got a wrong, a misunderstanding of things. And those things stick with me because a lot of times in life, our focus is um, diverted from the things that really matter. We tend to wander off. We tend to focus on things that are periphery, on the outskirts instead of the main things. And yes, even over this time of the COVID pandemic, we've seen how we are called to focus on the things that really do matter but our hearts are prone to wonder. And also in that focus, if we apply this focus in our lives with a wrong understanding, with the wrong motive, we could also have the wrong end of the stick. And so it's the same in the Christian life. We have a focus 
And there's a way of keeping that focus. And unfortunately, we tend to miss this sometimes. But God in his wisdom gives us his word and his spirit to help us with this. So today, as we go through our text in Mark chapter 10 from verse 32 to 45, I want you to remember this. Focus and having a right understanding. So let's read together from verse 32 of chapter 10. It says, And they were on the road going up to Jerusalem, and Jesus was walking ahead of them. And they were amazed, and those who followed were afraid. And taking the twelve again, he began to tell them what was to happen to him, saying, We are going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be delivered over to the chief priests and the scribes, and they will condemn him to death and deliver him over to the Gentiles. And they will mock him and spit on him and flog him and kill him. And after three days, he will rise. Let's pause here for a moment. Here we see a flint-like focus to Jesus. It's maybe not so evident in this text itself, but in Luke uh, 9.53, it says that Jesus set his face towards Jerusalem. It was a significant moment for Jesus because now he's preparing for what lies ahead in Jerusalem. He's preparing for his death and his resurrection. And that is the main reason why Jesus came. And so Jesus leads the way and uh, leads the way and his 12 disciples along with others follow him. His face is set like flint towards Jerusalem and nothing will deter him. And it's amazing to see that you have his disciples, those who were close with him, the 12, and you have an extended crowd. And so their responses are quite uh, amazing to see. It says the disciples were amazed or astonished because they could see this change in Jesus as his behavior uh, changed and set towards uh, Jerusalem because he knew what lay ahead of him there. Um, and so they were amazed that Jesus would set his face towards Jerusalem where hostility awaits him there, where he's impending death. They could already observe that the priests and the, the Jewish leaders were waiting to find an opportunity to get rid of Jesus. So they knew what lay ahead. But Jesus, they were amazed that he set his face towards Jerusalem, even knowing this is what would lie ahead of him. The other followers were probably more like us, were afraid because they could have an idea as well. They could sense through Jesus' ministry that his popularity is now declining, that people around him, the, the Jewish leaders and the religious leaders of the day were more and more suspicious of Jesus. They wanted to get rid of him. He was public enemy number one. And so they were associated with Jesus. And so they were expecting to bear the same brunt of suffering and persecution that would have awaited Jesus. But Jesus in this time takes his 12 disciples aside and again begins to do some focused teaching with them on his death and resurrection. And you can see this becomes an emphasis. No longer is he addressing the crowds, but more the 12 because he's preparing them for some significant things. And this is the third time that Jesus predicts his death and resurrection. But this time, in the third time, he gives us so much more details and the picture becomes much clearer for his disciples. He mentions again that he is the son of man, that uh, a specific uh, person that the Jewish people would have been aware of, it's spoken about much in the Old Testament, specifically in Daniel chapter 7. This is the Son of Man, a divine person that is expected to come, the Savior, the Messiah, the one who would rule over the people of Israel and the world. But it says that he will be delivered over to the chief priests and the scribes. That was just the Jewish leaders who would condemn him to death and deliver him to the Gentiles or to the Romans who would mock him, would spit on him, scourge him and kill him. But he would rise three days later. Now this is very detailed and very specific. If you look at the words, there's no doubt here. There's no words like might be on Jesus' statements. No, he says the words will. There is a certainty to his prediction. And if you read what happens later in Mark and in the other gospel accounts, these things actually happen. Because Jesus is truth and he speaks truth. And so you and I can take him at his word. What is even more amazing about this prediction of Jesus is that it was prophesied in Psalm 2 and in many other portions of scripture in the Old Testament. But in Psalm 2 specifically, because we are going through a devotional through Psalms, you would have seen that. It speaks about the, the nations 
um, that they are in turmoil, that they gather together, that's Gentiles and Jews, to conspire together against God and His anointed one, who is Jesus. And so later in Acts chapter 4, verse 26 to 27, it shows that Herod and Pilate, which are the Gentiles and the Jews, actually did only what God had predestined would happen. They, yes, they all conspired together to put Jesus to death, but Jesus' death was no tragedy. It was part of God's sovereign plan. You see, all these people were part of God's amazing plan. God was behind it all, working uh, everything out, orchestrating it all according to His plan of salvation for the world. And the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ was part of God's sovereign plan that was coming to pass. It is vital, it is a vital part, a key part of God's plan. In fact, I would say it's the central piece and the central focus of God's plan of redemption for the world. It's no wonder that Jesus highlighted at least three times. You're probably asking the question, why did Jesus have to predict and teach about his death this many times? Well, I believe it's that significant. It's that important. It's central and not periphery. It demands our attention and our focus because without it, we have no foundation as Christians. This is the primary reason Jesus came to the earth. We cannot lose focus of it even today. This is the basis of our salvation, of our adoption as children of God, of us receiving the Holy Spirit and our ongoing maturity and our mission to make disciples of all nations. It is the answer to people's greatest need and it is the answer to why the world is broken. Yet, it is unfortunate to see how the church seems to lose focus of this all of the time. Now in this time of COVID-19, it's sad to see that churches and leaders have lost sight of this which is at the heart of the gospel. While there are people who are faithfully preaching and staying rooted in who Jesus is and what He has done in His death and resurrection, many are focusing on wild speculation, on conspiracy theories, on crazy prophecies, and empty means of trying to entertain, hype, and superficially assure people who are fearful, who are anxious, who are hopeless, and have uncertainty in their hearts. And my question is, where are the preachers, where are the Christians who are holding out the message of Jesus' death and resurrection, which provides real hope, forgiveness of sins, redemption, reconciliation with God, adoption as children of God, and eternal life in the midst of this crisis. You see, this is still the only answer, my dear friends. There is no other. The message of a crucified Savior Jesus in the place of sinners for their redemption, for their forgiveness, for their adoption as children of God, for their reconciliation with God, and His resurrection from the dead that gives us the hope of eternal life is still the only answer today. This is the focus. This must be our focus. Don't forget that. Don't move on from this. Remind yourself of this and remember this as you walk the Christian life. Friends, there is a focus and we need to stay rooted on this focus. It is about who Jesus is and what He has done in His death and His resurrection. The church of God never moves beyond this message. It provides the basis for everything that we do do. And while there are many that would want to move away from this, I want to encourage you and I want to strongly encourage you to keep your focus on who Jesus is and what He has done for us. And on that basis, you would remember all of God's promises and that will enable you not only to be a faithful follower of Jesus Christ, but also one who would be ready to proclaim the message of who He is to many who need to hear it today. It's no wonder that Jesus left these two main ordinances for the church, water baptism, which reminds us of His death and resurrection, and the Lord's Supper, which uh, we need to do uh, regularly to remind us of who Jesus is, what He has done for us in His death and in His resurrection. So that is the focus for us. And that's an important focus for the church now. It has been a focus through the centuries and it must continue to be the focus of the church until Jesus comes back again. Now let's move on to see the disciples' response to this. In Jesus' 
previous two predictions uh, of his death and resurrection, it led to a failure on the part of the disciples. Let's see if this is any different. Let's read the next part of the text. And it says in verse 35 of chapter 10 of Mark, And James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came up to him and said to him, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask of you. And he said to them, What do you want me to do for you? And they said to him, Grant us to sit one at your right hand and one at your left in your glory. Jesus said to them, You do not know what you are asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink or to be baptized with the baptism with which I am baptized? And he said to them, I'm sorry, and they said to him, We are able. And Jesus said to them, The cup that I drink, you will drink. And with the baptism with which I am baptized, you will be baptized. But to sit at my right hand or at my left is not mine to grant. But this is for those for whom it has been prepared. And when the ten heard it, they began to be indignant at James and John. And Jesus called them to him and said to them, You know that those who are considered rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great ones exercise authority over them. But it shall not be so among you. But whoever would be great among you must be your servant, and whoever would be first among you must be slave of all. For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. You should directly, after such a sobering prediction like that from Jesus, the response should have been one of wonder, of awe, of fear, maybe more questions about the events and how that will take place. But this is not the case with James and John, though. Just like the previous two predictions, the disciples reveal their lack of understanding of what type of a Savior Jesus is and how he would fulfill that role as a Savior or Messiah. James and John rather use this opportunity to ask Jesus another type of request, a request that exposes their misunderstanding as well as the motivations of their heart. Maybe they saw the culmination of Jesus' earthly ministry coming to a close, nearing, and they expect some sort of earthly rulership by Jesus. They see a gap and a window of opportunity, of opportunity for themselves to get some position of authority and influence. Can you believe their request of Jesus? They say, we want to ask, we want you to do whatever we ask. How presumptuous is that? Can you sense, can you hear the sense of entitlement in this request from James and John? In good South African slang, there is no scam here. They're not ashamed of this. They just openly approach him. They want Jesus to do whatever they ask of him. But before we judge them, isn't that how often how we approach Jesus as our genie, the one who must give us whatever we think we need or want? Like, hey, Jesus, hook me up with whatever I need in this time. Isn't that the response from many of us? But I love Jesus' response. His response is to play along. I love how he always goes in the direction to see what's in the hearts of people. He asked them, what do they want him to do? James and John won positions of prominence, of authority and influence when they see Jesus come into his glory or when they see him and expect him to start exercising his authority as Lord and King in the kingdom of God. James and John, along with the other disciples, have already been promised by Jesus that they would rule with him in the future. But now they are seeking an even more privileged and prominent role. And if you remember, Jesus, uh, after his transfiguration, took James, John, and Peter aside and explained to them. Now it seems like James and John are excluding Peter and it's just the two of them. This just exposes the human heart. You know, and yet again, let's not be quick to judge. Isn't that our hearts and motives? We love positions of influence and power to get one up over somebody else to show how more privileged we ought to be, how we ought to be more in the golden circle or how we can prove that we should be there. Jesus highlights James and John's ignorance though. They don't know what they are saying or asking of Jesus. They are ignorant of what they desire to have authority and influence in the kingdom of God actually involves. They don't know what it entails. They know Jesus as Messiah and Savior, 
but they don't have any idea of what this task as a savior or as a messiah actually involves. You see, it involves suffering before glory. This is the mark of our savior. He is a suffering servant before he rises in power and ascends to glory. And so Jesus asked more searching questions of them. The same searching questions we can ask of ourselves. Can they drink of the cup that he would drink or be baptized with his baptism? And both the cup here and the baptism are parallel metaphors to describe something significant. The cup generally refers to God's wrath and punishment over sin. So Jesus is asking them, are you able to bear this cup, the same cup that he asked the Father to perhaps remove from him in the Garden of Gethsemane when he was praying? Can they bear this cup? Can they bear the punishment of God and his wrath over sin? Are they able to do this? Baptism would also refer to Jesus' sacrificial death, not uh, anything else that we might think it would be with water baptism, but specifically Jesus' sacrificial death, his sin bearing death that satisfied the wrath of God in the place of sinners. This is what Jesus is saying. Can you bear this cup? Can you have this baptism like mine? And again, James and John's response is mind-blowing. I'm floored at their response. Their response is, we can. Such ignorance, such entitlement. They have no idea of what Jesus would actually go through to die in the place of sinners. They think they can do what only Jesus or God can do. And isn't that the essence of sin? Trying to be God, God's ourself, thinking that we can do what only God can do and not submitting to God and His plans and His purposes and His word. Jesus says that they will face persecution and suffering later as part of living out the commission that he has given them. But to die the death that Jesus needed to die in the place of sinners for their salvation, that is something that they would never be able to do. Their suffering would not be for the salvation of sinners like Jesus, but more as identifying with their Savior Jesus. You see, James and John uh, would suffer this persecution James would be killed, like we see in Acts chapter 12. John would suffer persecution and exile on the island of Patmos. And this is the mark of a Christ follower. There is suffering before glory. Not only for Jesus, but also for his followers. Which is what makes the promises of the prosperity gospel that we hear such a false picture of true disciples of Jesus, who himself suffered. In this gospel, People usually say that Jesus suffered so that we don't have to suffer or won't suffer. Well, this text just blows that out of the water. Now, as disciples, we should expect suffering in this world. I'm not proclaiming to be a prophet of doom that that God gets some joy out of this, but we can expect suffering. It is the mark of the true disciple. We can expect persecution. Jesus taught this in this world, but we know that this world will pass away. And we are citizens of heaven. We are passing through where we're expecting a new heaven and a new earth where we can expect no more suffering, no more death, no more tears one day when Jesus comes back again. But in this world and now, as we are called to live out this commission to tell people about this crucified and risen Savior in whom they can find salvation and hope and eternal life, Now, while we are living in this time, we can expect suffering in a broken world. And let us not forget that. And I love that Jesus then shows his submission to the Father, saying that these positions are not for him to grant. It's such a great Trinitarian picture of God. Jesus, who is truly God himself, yet he willingly submits to the Father, his will and his plan. There's such a great picture of submission, of servanthood and humility. It's in the heart and nature of our God and Savior. So he doesn't ask us to do something which he himself, within the context of the Trinitarian nature of God, do as well. And how God demonstrates this for us. And so don't forget that picture of Christ who is in the image of God, in the nature of God, yet submits 
willingly and faithfully to the will of the Father, who is the one who has uh, prepared these positions and will grant them and give them to those who are called to occupy them. Now we move on to the other disciples. Just when you might have pity on the other disciples, and uh, when you see James and John trying to get these prominent, get these prominent places or uh, positions of influence for themselves, just as you might think like, ah, oh, man, what a shame for these other disciples who want to follow Jesus faithfully, and yet you have these other two with such pride and arrogance in their hearts. Just as you have pity on them, their hearts are exposed as well. They become angry and indignant with James and John. Why? Because they probably had similar intentions. They might have looked for an opportunity to get Jesus by himself and probably ask him something similar. And so again, we all don't have pure motives if we're honest with ourselves. We can judge others, but our motives are not always pure, even in desiring to follow God in his plans for us. And so we need God to purify us. And he does this as we submit to him. But Jesus, in his response to James and John and what is happening around him, as he does always, uses this opportunity as a teaching moment. And so he gathers the 12 together and he points them to a scenario that the disciples are familiar with. The Gentiles or the Roman ruling authority over them. So Jesus now uses this as an example to contrast the Roman authority structure and its values and how it exercises authority over people and he contrasts this and compares this to how um, leadership and how authority is expected to be exercised in the kingdom of God. They are vastly different. They are on either sides of the spectrum. They are polar opposites. The Gentile leaders rule over their people as masters. They are hard taskmasters and they are heavy handed. They are results driven. They have no real concern for those under their authority. Does this sound familiar to you? Yes, it sounds much like our secular and corporate culture today that many of you find yourself in. Now, just to be clear, there is nothing wrong with exercising authority, but Jesus is here highlighting how authority ought to be exercised. This is what matters. Jesus expects the total opposite from his followers and his disciples. His words are very clear. Not so with you. Let this not be so among you. Leadership and authority in the kingdom of God involves serving. It's about becoming a servant. It is selfless and it is others orientated. If you want to be great in the kingdom, you must be a servant. You must be last. You must be a slave. It's the total reverse of the worldly idea of leadership and authority. It is upside down if you like this type of serving and leadership doesn't lead to greatness this serving is the greatness true greatness involves being a servant and a slave and it's not just about being fair and just those are good things it actually goes beyond that it's much more radical than that it does not include public honor and the authority to command others but humble and often unrewarding service. And to explain how different the exercise of authority and leadership in the kingdom of God is, Jesus then uses himself as the greatest example to illustrate this. He does not ask his disciples to do something that he himself does not do. I love how Jesus describes himself. He says, he is the son of man who is God yet can fully relate to us as people because he came to us as a person. Even though he was in the very nature of God, he became a person. He added a human nature to his already divine nature as God and became a servant. He laid aside his privileges and became obedient even to the point of death. You can read that in Philippians chapter 2, verses 6 to 11. He came to serve and not to be served. He was selfless, and he came for the sake of others. He gave his life. He did this voluntarily. He wasn't just killed. He offered himself voluntarily as a perfect substitute and sacrifice of, for the sins of others. He surrendered his life, 
and his surrender's life was the ransom that was paid for the redemption of others. A price was paid for your and my freedom from sin and death. A price that satisfied God's holy requirement to punish sin. You see, Jesus didn't die a martyr's, de a martyr's death, but a selfless, sacrificial, and substitutionary death on your and my behalf. And this is true greatness. This is true greatness, that the one who was God, or in the very nature, God himself came and became like one of us, became like a servant, became obedient to the point of death, died a death that he did not deserve in our place for people who did not deserve God's grace and mercy. He died in our place. In our place, he stood condemned for the sins and the punishment which we deserved. And he held out forgiveness and grace and love to us all who would trust in him and in his sacrificial death for us in our place. And when he had died, he rose again from the dead in victory over the sin that enslaved all of us. And he did this for many. It says for many. He died this death as a ransom for many, as many as those who would trust in him alone to save them, as many as those who would repent of their sins and believe in Jesus Christ. God desires for many to be saved. So yes, Jesus exercised authority, but he did so as a suffering servant who came to serve others. He was selfless, and this is true greatness. This is not weak. And our model for leadership and exercising any level of authority in God's kingdom is Jesus. And here, when we look at Jesus, there is no room for entitlement. There is no room for platform seeking. There is no room for elevation of self. There is no room for personal glory. There is no room for bullying people. There is no room for arrogance, pride, and building towards yourself. That motive is leading with the wrong end of the stick that I mentioned earlier. That motive is totally different from the motive that Jesus requires us to have in leading God's people. We need to have a very different focus. We need to grab the other end of the stick. We need to go almost and turn this upside down and lead the way that Jesus has called us to lead as servants. Now, all of this might be good. You might be saying, Sean, this is good, but what, how does this apply to me? Well, I think there's many applications. Firstly, as church leaders, I'd love to address church leaders who are maybe listening. We need to remember that we are called to exercise authority based on the principles in God's Word, the Bible. And they are very different to the corporate and secular environments around us. You see, church leaders are not called to be professionals. Yes, they must be qualified according to God's Word, but not professional like we see and it's defined in the secular and corporate world around us. Even our qualifications for leaders in the context of the church seem very different to those in the secular world. And so we cannot embrace a corporate culture in church leadership. We cannot import leadership values and principles that govern the secular world, the corporate culture, and import them and copy and paste them in the context of the church or the kingdom of God. And the church is the vehicle through which the kingdom of God comes on earth. And so the culture within the church needs to reflect the culture of the kingdom of God, especially as it relates to leadership and authority. You see, pastors are not CEOs running a business for the sake of profits and to report back to and, and be answerable to shareholders. Pastors are not CEOs that are given um, resources and people just to be used for whatever reason they can to get to these results that need to be achieved. People are not just res resources to be used for other means. In fact, 1 Peter, 1, um, 1 Peter 5 verses 1 to 5 calls for pastors who lead willingly, humbly, and as examples of the ultimate leader of the church, Jesus Christ. They are not to lead for shameful gain and as domineering and manipulative leaders. There is no room for pride, self-promotion, bullying, arrogance, and manipulation. And COVID-19 has exposed some of this. As much as the technology is a great tool, 
by God's grace to facilitate the church staying connected and functioning to an extent, you also get to see church leaders who have built towards themselves and for their namesake. You hear more of this technology and these platforms used to promote their personal ministries. You hear more about themselves and what, is God, and what God is doing through them than about Jesus Christ. My question is, where is the humility? Where are the servant leaders that Jesus is calling that in this time would rise up and show what true leadership is? to serve Jesus and to serve the people with the message of the gospel. And if you are not leading like this as a pastor, but as a humble servant leader, I want to encourage you to continue. You are not weak. People considered Jesus weak for leading in this way. People considered Paul weak for leading in this way. And I want to say you are in good company. Continue. God will be honored. Keep on leading in this way. And if you're in the church, maybe you're not in leadership, maybe you're a part of a local congregation, and in that congregation you have humble servant leaders who are faithful to God's word, I want to encourage you, pray for them. Submit to them as they must serve you and give an account to Jesus for you. Be thankful for them. And please, don't expect them to be superstars or CEOs, or entertainers, or anything other than what God's Word expects of them. Rather yourself, be a servant and use your gifts to serve others for the glory of Jesus Christ. Or maybe you are part of a church, or maybe you're just a leader in other spheres. If you're a Christian and you hold a position of influence in another sphere, like government, or business, or education, or social work, I know that there are different values and principles that govern how you ought to lead in these spheres. I want to encourage you to work hard, serve anyway, set an example of godly leadership, and treat people as valuable who are created in the image of God. Be a servant leader and use every opportunity to give the reason for the hope that you have and for your philosophy in servant leadership. This might be a great chance to tell people about who Jesus is and what he has done, to share the gospel and the good news. When you have leaders in different contexts leading the way Jesus desires of us, people are able to see that as different. Use that responsibility or use that platform to tell people about Jesus. And then lastly, if you're listening and you're wondering, you, maybe you do not know Christ, you do not know Jesus, and you're wondering why, true greatness is being a servant and the things just don't add up to you, I want to point you again to Jesus, the greatest servant ever. You see, all other belief systems call for us to earn our way or to obtain God's favor and salvation by doing things ourselves, to make ourselves right before God, to show God we have done um, these things right and to make ourselves right before Him. And God is portrayed as this distant God this transcendent God in these systems, but not so in the Christian belief system. Here we have God who is not only transcendent and high and holy and exalted, but also imminent and with us. We have God who became like one of us in the person of Jesus Christ. He brought salvation to us in the selfless life and sacrificial death and glorious resurrection of Jesus Christ. And all this is available through the free gift of grace of God that comes to us in Jesus Christ. You are called to receive this freely by turning from your sins and your own merits and by believing in Jesus Christ alone to save you. The greatest servant has made a way for you to be saved. The greatest servant ever is Jesus Christ. Trust in him. He not only saves you, but then he calls you to live and to lead like him as a servant in true greatness. And there is no greater gift and privilege than to know Jesus and to trust in him and to believe in him and to receive the gift of eternal life, to be called as those who are sons and daughters of the living God and been given the gift of the Holy Spirit and the privilege to walk in union with Jesus and then commissioned by him 
to tell people in this world about him and he as being their greatest need. I want to encourage you to come to Christ and put your trust in him. Shall we bow our heads in prayer? Heavenly Father, we want to thank you <clears throat> for your word today, Lord. Your word today which calls us to be focused on the thing that really matters, that is on Jesus Christ, on who he is and what he has done for us in his death and in his resurrection. It is a key focus that we have seen today. Help us, Lord, by your spirit to stay rooted and focused on this. This is the basis of everything we're called to do as Christians. This is the basis of, of who we are in Christ. This is the basis of our salvation. This is the basis of our maturing and becoming more like Jesus. This is the basis of us taking the message of Christ to the world. Help us never to move away from this focus. Keep us, we pray, our eyes fixed on Jesus Christ and what he has done for us. Let it change us continually and let it be the message that we hold out to a dying, a broken and fearful world in this time. And then help us, Lord, with our motives, Lord, where we have an incorrect understanding, where our motives are impure, Lord, in serving you. I pray, Lord, change that. Where we exercise authority in any measure, Lord, help us to look to you, Christ. You are the greatest servant, Lord. You call us to serve, Lord. You call us to, uh, to a life, Lord, of, 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 of a servant and of a slave, to be last and not first, Lord. This is true greatness in the kingdom of God. Let us serve in this way, I pray, Lord. And grant us, Lord, by your Spirit to do this joyfully and obediently, Lord. And as we do this, may many come to see Christ much more clearly, Lord. May many see the great shepherd, the good shepherd. May many see the greatest servant, Jesus Christ, and put their trust in him. Help us to turn this around, Lord, in our leadership and in our exercise of authority in the church, Lord. We are not professionals. We are not called to be influenced by the culture around us. This is the culture in the kingdom of God. Servant leaders, people who exercise authority as servants who need to give an account to the greatest servant, Jesus Christ. Let us do that. Let it be freeing. Let it be liberating for us, Lord, and let it bring glory to Jesus Christ. And then I pray that everyone here today, Lord, that they would hear the clear message, those who do not know you. For the Son of Man came, not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. My prayer is that if you are listening, that you would turn and put your trust in Jesus Christ. He is the one that has died for your sins and rose again. And he is able to give you forgiveness, redemption, to bring you to God and to give you the hope of eternal life. Believe him, in him today, I pray, and be reconciled to God through him. And I pray this in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen. Thank you for listening. May God bless you. I pray that this message will continue to minister to you through the course of this week and may it bring transformation as to how you live your life as a Christ follower. God bless you and we'll see you again soon.